Good morning, explorers, and welcome to Aquarium Live. My name is Alicia, and I'm very excited to be joining you today. Now, you are going to be going on an adventure with myself and our friend from the Ocean Rangers, Captain Joe. Now, Captain Joe has been sent out to help us investigate more about animal adaptations. Now, an adaptation is something an animal has on its body or even what it does to help it survive in its home or its habitat. So we're going to be doing some exploring today. We're going to be playing some games. We're going to be visiting our animal hospital. Now, uh, if you have any questions along the way, you're curious about anything, if you have any comments or observations, please feel free to text us at 562-286-1838 during our program today. Now, I'm not by myself. I have a few helpers today. I have Stacy and Amanda. Stacy's helping with all of the controls in our studio, and Miss Amanda is uh, responding to your questions and passing those along to me. So if we get a chance to answer them today, I'd be happy to do that. All right. Now, in order to start our investigation, I had um, sent Captain Joe out. Let's go ahead and check in with him. Uh, uh, <laughs> Captain Joe, what are you doing? Oh, oh, Ocean Ranger salute. That's right. What, what are you doing, what do Captain you mean Joe? What I'm, doing? I'm making sandcastles. You told me today to find an animal that makes sandcastles, and that was an easy one because I make exquisite sandcastles. <laughs> it, that is very nice, but I said an animal that makes sand. Well, why aren't we talking about pearfish? That sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right, I want to introduce you to this animal because it has some crazy adaptations. So this is a tropical animal. It's called a parrotfish, and we're looking at its food. Look at that, this is coral. Coral is really hard. In order to take bites of that coral, look at its mouth. Its mouth is different than maybe some other fish. It has these hard plate-like structures to help it, kind of like a beak, take a bite out of this coral animal. And uh, if it didn't have that, it wouldn't be able to take those bites. We wouldn't be able to bite that really hard calcium outer layer. That's really interesting. What do you think about that, Captain Joe? What do you think about that, Captain Joe? A pair of wait, fish is able wait. to, yes. Studio. Yes. So if the if the parrot fish doesn't use it, um, where where does the hard coral go? Oh yes, nope. they have. No, nope, sure. Give it to me straight, please tell me. Okay, it's kind of it's kind of kind of gross. Okay, so they take the bite of all that sh kind of like a shell material, and it has to leave the parrot fish. They can't keep all those hard parts inside of them, so when they use the bathroom, that coral, which gets ground up, turns into sand. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what's, so oh, playing you've with been fish poop. playing with sand. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry, Captain Joe. It, it's not from the same places that you were, that you are right now. This, they like to live in places like Palau, which are found in very warm areas around our planet. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> so what you're telling me is that the beak of a parrotfish is actually an adaptation to eat very hard and tough objects. That is really, really cool. You know, Captain Joe, that's not even the craziest thing. They have a mucus sleeping bag that they blow all over their body. Mucus pajamas? <laughs> you can call them kind of like pajamas. Maybe not like your polka dotted pajamas. Well, that is a very good adaptation for protection. And now that I think about it, I think I know another animal that mm. has a great adaptation for protection. Why don't you go ahead and meet me inside the aquarium? Okay, Captain Joe. We're going to take a minute and talk a little bit more about this kind of weird, crazy, fun, gross adaptation that our parrotfish friends have. So thank you, Miss Stacy. She put up a picture here of the parrotfish and it is getting all settled in for its nighttime. And they do like to rest in the coral reef. And you'll see that it has these special fins to help it kind of what we call perch. And so it settles into the reef and then it blows out of its, its face a huge mucus sleeping bag, like a big snot ball all over its body. And I, it's gross, Stacy's laughing at me, it's gross. And this is kind of what it looks like, that clear layer. Now, why does it do that? Well, it, 
supposedly it, it makes it harder for a predator, an animal that might eat it, to smell the parrotfish while it's taking its little parrotfish nap. So it has this covering over it. That's what scientists think. In the morning, uh, it will either let this drift away or sometimes they even suck it back in its body and they eat it because overnight, because it's sticky, it's been catching all kinds of little floating animals. So yeah, it does a lot for it. It's pretty gross. Uh, oh, we have our first question in. So we'll just take a bro break. Uh, why is it colored like this? So if we're talking about the, the parrotfish, that's a great, um, maybe we can visit one of our other exhibits that are brightly colored. I'll have Miss Stacy see if our, one of our webcams uh, is available to pull up here behind us. So perfect. So this is a zoom in look to a coral reef. Now, what colors do you notice in this habitat? Whoa, hello there, Antheus. A lot of these fish in here are called Antheus. And there are these bright colors. And these bright colors might stand out if you only live down here in the sand, but because they live around that coral, which is the prey for, again, the parrotfish, then they blend in. So having some of these bright colors in a very colorful environment helps you uh, camouflage. And parrotfish will change colors throughout their life. So when they're tiny little fish fry, that's what they call a baby fish, isn't that cute? They will be one color, and as they grow up, they tend to be different colors. Um, that's not the same for all fish, but the parrotfish is pretty unique. And you can see it has these beautiful kind of rainbow colors. And there's different kinds of parrotfish, um, but they have that similar beak and food source for them. Okay, so I think right now what we're going to do is um, see if Captain Joe has made it up to our next exhibit that we're going to be exploring. Hello boys and girls, I am here in our warm water tropical exhibit looking for our next animal, the puffer fish. Now you might be wondering what different types of adaptations a puffer fish has. If you take a very close look at its skin, you'll notice that there are very small spikes surrounding its body. Now say an animal like a shark or something else wants to have a puffer fish for lunch, or well, what that puffer will do is get a huge gulp of water and it'll make those spikes stick out on its body and get very, very large. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's going to make a very appetizing lunch. Oh, so it's using its shape. Are there any other animals that use its shape as an adaptation, Captain Joe? Why, yes, we have an animal like that very close by. Now, the puffers are big and round, but this animal that I have is very long and slender. We will talk about it right after you guys play a very fun game. Great. Thank you, Captain Joe. That was so cool. Did you see how the puffer fish puffed? Yeah, so normally the puffer fish has these spikes around its body, but they lay flat on its body and they don't really puff up. You know, we've had um, puffer fish here before at the aquarium and they're so comfortable just hanging out with <laughs> their aquarium friends and the people that take care of them that they very, very rarely puff up here at the aquarium. We usually have people that will ask us, how come they're not puffed? Well, they just use that adaptation if they're trying to defend themselves, like you saw with that shark. So they suck in water and they <laughs> bloom out. That's my uh, puffer fish impression, by the way. If you wanted to also have this wonderful puffer fish impression, you can just, <laughs> there you go. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Stacy. All right. So Something else to look at. What are some other things that you notice about our puffer fish? So we are talking about changing shape. We did mention a little bit about color. What do you notice about the color on this animal? Kind of different, right? Do you notice anything special? Well, I happen to notice that it has these stripes on its body. And one of these stripes is actually hiding its eye. So it might be a little bit harder for a predator to know where the eye is on this animal. So why would they want to confuse a predator like that? Well, if you're chasing down your, your fish food, you want to be able to grab it from the front so it can't get away. But if a predator has a hard time noticing where the front of the fish is, it might make it a little bit easier for the puffer fish to get away. Now the puffer fish is going to first try to swim 
away. And then if it can't escape the predator, then it will puff up. And you can see it has these nice um, spikes on its body to, to help it do that. The other thing too, we, we were talking about mouths. The mouth of a puffer fish is pretty cool. There are kind of two groups of puffer fish. Either they have two crushing kind of like teeth in their mouth or they have four and they are able to crush up and eat little animals. Some of, some of those have shells like crabs or snails, um, worms when they're a little bit smaller. It's pretty cool. So looking at the mouth of an animal, you know, kind of thinking about the mouth and what's found inside the mouth of an animal as an adaptation, as a tool to help it survive. All right, so uh, I have a couple other questions that have come up. Thank you, Explorers, for participating today. So we have a question that says, where does the mucus come from? That's a good question. You can almost see it right here. It's coming right from their mouth. So they're able to produce that. And um, another question that we had is, have you ever seen a puffer fish puff up, puff up at the aquarium? And that is from Junie from Sunnyside. You know what, I have been here at the aquarium for June will be 15 years and I have never seen a puffer fish at the aquarium puff up. I have seen a puffer fish puff up when I went snorkeling in um, the warm waters of Costa Rica. We saw a puffer fish and it, whoop, it puffed up. But because our puffers here are so comfortable with the people that take care of them and the animals that they live with, I will tell you that it's usually very rare for them to puff up. They usually just do it if they feel like they're, they're being chased. So our puffers, it's, it's really cool to see, but because they're nice and comfortable here at the aquarium, it's not something that happens uh, very often. And then how big can they puff up? You know what, that's a great question. So this animal here has kind of um, extra folds of skin. I don't know if you can kind of see that it's wrinkly on top, and those extra folds of skin allow them to puff up much bigger. So if you were to start from their, the tip of their, their mouth to the tip of their tail, you would see this animal expand like a balloon. Now we are looking at a smaller species, so you could probably fit about this big. This is how, about how big that this fish is. And they would turn into like a little football. But we, there is a, a type of puffer, um, the porcupine puffer that gets very big and they're the largest and I have seen them out uh, in Hawaii actually about this big and they get huge also that was a, a big fish I didn't see it puff up at all it was kind of bossy it has these big teeth <laughs> a lot of fish were swimming away from it it didn't want to come close uh, so it was kind of the boss of its habitat. It already got into a size that other animals didn't really want to mess with it, especially since if they did get close, it had some pretty good spines on it. So the giant porcupine puffer, if you have a chance to look it up, it's pretty cool. But again, they have those big teeth and they're pretty bossy. I call them a, a bossy critter. Now, I think we have a puzzle, right, Miss Stacy, that we're gonna play. So in our puzzle, we're gonna flip over pieces of an animal that's hidden, and then we're gonna freeze it and give you a chance to see if you know what's hiding underneath. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we also have our, our text number is if you would like to text on. Remember, for our younger explorers out there, make sure that you have permission from an adult before you text and that normal texting rates do apply. Okay, are you looking close? Did you figure out what kind of animal this is? Yeah, so this animal is actually an animal that lives not in warm waters, but they live more locally, they live off of our Southern California coast in cold waters. Maybe we'll take a, a, a minute to look at their habitat um, and, and see what those colors are. What colors do you notice? So this animal here, I'm noticing different shades of pink. So we have our lighter pink and darker pink here. And this animal really does stand out. So it's not using its colors to camouflage. It's using its colors a little bit differently. 
Um, as we wait for maybe some answers to come in, maybe we'll take a peek at the habitat. And we might even see this animal swimming around. We'll see. Hmm. Okay, so Miss Stacy said it's not swimming, it's but it is in here. It's perching, as we call it. So that Salmon from Logan, that's Logan's guess. California sheephead. Karen said goldfish. Awesome, so lots of guesses right now. Wonderful, so something that all of our guesses have in common is that it's a fish. Nice job, let's go ahead and finish our puzzle and then we'll go back to our webcam and, and maybe we'll see if our animals a little bit easier to find. You know what, I like that you brought up salmon. Salmon are a nice bright color as well, but this fish is a little bit different. Same kind of colors though, nice work. This is a California sheep head. So this is an animal that gets fairly large. Um, the one that we have on exhibit is about this big, and they're not all that big. The males get to be this big color. They have the nice bright chin, and they have these bright pink colors. And this nice bright chin is easy to find in a kelp forest when the colors are those um, kind of blues and browns and greens and grays. So this, this animal wants to stand out. It wants to say, hey, this is my area of kelp forest and I will defend it. And you can even look inside, it has a tooth. <laughs> it has multiple teeth, but in this picture, I think it's kind of funny. It looks like it just has one tooth, just kind of stricken at the bottom, but it does have some pretty good teeth that allow it to eat um, prickly sea urchins. I think I have a picture of a prickly sea urchin here for you. So it can eat things like prickly sea urchins, lobsters off of the bottom. So it's able to take pretty good bites. This can be an animal that um, defends its, its habitat, its home really, really well. And the female, on the other hand, is a bit smaller and has more what we call muted colors, colors to help with blending in. And so it's a little hard to see. Maybe you can tune into our webcams at some time. This is the California sheep head, and I probably wouldn't have seen it because it's in the back, but um, as we walk around the aquariums in the morning, I can see it just kind of hanging out. This is the rock it likes to perch in. It doesn't seem uh, like it wants to move. And then this middle band right here is that big light pink stripe that it has on its body. So maybe we'll, we'll check in and see later if, uh, if it's decided to move from its, its home. All right, I think we have a message from Captain Joe. He was gonna investigate an animal that uses its shape to help it survive its habitat. Let's go ahead and take a peek to see if he found that animal. Welcome back, boys and girls. We have our next animal here, a very small animal from our garden eel exhibit. Now these little eels use their long slender body to hide in the sand. They also have great color to camouflage, including two black spots on their backs. These spots are meant to look like eyes to scare away predators. These little eels have much larger relatives found in different habitats, like the moray eel found in our Southern California waters and the honeycomb eel found in tropical habitats. All of them use their long ribbon-shaped bodies to hide and find food. Garden eels emerge out of their homes to grab small animals as they drift by. Did you see that? That was so cool. So the garden eel, uh, they're about the size of my hand. They're not too big. They can get a little bit bigger, but they hide in those sandy areas along, just outside of a kelp, uh, sorry, a coral reef habitat. And they're trying to catch plankton. Plankton are little drifting plants and animals. Sometimes those little plants and animals are baby animals. Sometimes they're plankton their whole life. But they just drift along in the currents. And there are quite a few animals that eat just plankton. They call them planktivores, kind of like a, a carnivore, but they eat a specific thing. So they will hide in the sand and then they pop up which is really cool. Having that long body allows them to dip in and out of the sand. The other thing that a lot of the eels have that helps them as an adaptation 
unlike other fish, they don't have scales. They have instead um, kind of like a, a skin on their body so that they're, as they're moving in and out of the sand, their scales um, aren't being removed. So lots of cool things. And then we talked about color as an adaptation as well. You can see that they have this really interesting color pattern. Do you notice anything about it? So I noticed these two spots here. Now this is another way we talked about tricking a predator. If you wanted to look a little bit bigger, sometimes animals pretend that they have big eyes on their bodies. These are called false eye spots to kind of look like they have, that this, that this piece of an animal might be part of a bigger animal that we can't see. So if you're swimming along the reef, you might see these first and think, oh, there's a bigger animal. I won't be able to eat that. And so using its, its shape and its color to help it in its home. Also, did you see its little mouth? It has kind of a short mouth. So this little mouth is used for eating those tiny things as they, um, as they leap up. All right, a couple more questions from um, our viewers here. Camilla asks, what, what eats puffer fish? Uh, that is a great question. There's, even though they are... Um, pokey like that. There are some sea snakes that will take advantage of a puffer. I think they have to be very careful of how they not only bite the puffer but eat the puffer. And I think they have, even though we showed that there are some sharks that won't be able to eat the um, puffer puffer fish. Um, I'm Amanda sharing with me here some some fun facts for us. There are some sharks that are still able to figure out how to eat them, and then also uh, people people eat puffer fish apparently. So, you know, I think that any predator of an animal that has um, you know prey that can stick out spikes from its body has to be very particular. So there are still predators, but they have to have special ways of getting around those spines. And then we have Logan from New Jersey. Are eels considered fish? Great question. So to be considered fish, you need to have gills and they have little gills. Believe it or not, gills are inside its body to help it breathe and they need to have a, a spine. And so having those two things, gills and a spine, help qualify you as a fish. So even though that they don't have scales on their body, which we had just talked about, um, and most fish do have scales. Not all of them do, but they're still fish. They have those two things. Those are some really great questions. Again, if you have any more questions, we have a few more moments for our show. You can always uh, text us in. You can also, if the show has already been aired and you're watching this as recorded, you can always contact us through our email at live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. Now, as part of our program today, we'd like to take always a, a minute to check in with our Molina Animal Care Center. And this is a special place that we have to help us care for over 12,000 animals here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now, when we do uh, reopen the aquarium and you have a chance to visit, I would recommend going out to the Molina Animal Care Center. We have these nice big windows, and if we ever have like a little checkup on one of our animals, then you can see right in and see our veterinary care team uh, working on those animals. So a lot of the work that they do there in there is to make sure that our animals stay nice and healthy, like checkups and dental exams, uh, and that's always really cool to learn about. Now, uh, we have asked Shara from our vet team She's a veterinary technician to talk to us a little bit more about our animal care. Welcome Ocean Rangers. My name is Shara Seals. I am a veterinary technician here at the Molina Animal Care Center, our veterinary hospital for the Aquarium of the Pacific's animals. I work with Dr. Lance Adams, our veterinarian. A veterinary technician is a fancy term for an animal nurse. That's what I do here. And today, we're gonna look at Heidi, one of our Magellanic penguins. She needs a physical exam. This is Heidi, this is one of our Magellanic penguins. We're gonna do a physical exam on her today. 
We use this, this is a stethoscope. We use this to listen to her lungs and her heart. This is an ophthalmoscope. We look at her eyes. And this is a thermometer. We have to take her temperature. Heidi's being very good. We look at her feathers to make sure they're in good quality so that she's able to thermoregulate, which means keeps her warm while she's swimming in the water. We look at her beak and her nostrils, and we even look at her feet. And we feel her belly to make sure there's nothing hard or anything out of the ordinary. Well, it looks like Heidi is in good health. She's pretty happy. Thanks for joining us, boys and girls. See you next time. I don't know about you, explorers but i love our penguins they're really a lot of fun it's exciting time for us here at the aquarium our penguins are starting to build nests and they might have new chicks for us this summer so pretty exciting you should stay tuned uh, you can even visit our webcams we have a new nest cam up if you wanted to take a peek at that all right so we had talked a lot about um, ocean animals let's go ahead and check in with captain joe and see Hey, Captain Joe, we've talked a lot about ocean animals. What about animals that are on land? Do you think you can maybe investigate a few of those for us? That sounds like a great idea. I've always wondered about some of our animals in our outside exhibits. Why don't you go ahead and meet me in Laura Keep Forest in a little bit? All right, thank you, Captain Joe. I do have a couple more questions here. Karen asks, how do eels keep their balance without fins? That is an excellent question. You know, eels, um, because they're hiding in really tight spaces, they don't want to have a lot of fins sticking out because they might get scraped in some of those really tight spaces that they're hiding, either in the sand like we saw with our garden eels or in the rocks like our uh, California moray eel. So that's kind of a trade-off. They're, they're not great at keeping their balance. Some of the ways that they swim though are different than other animals that kind of helps them out. So they're swimming differently. They, um, so they might live in these, these rock-like areas and we'll keep our eyes out to see if we see maybe our eel moving through. So instead of moving you know, with their fins in the front or in the back, they have a long, what we call ribbon-shaped body. There we go. Think, awesome. Look at how they're moving their whole body. I wouldn't say that eels have great balance. They're not going to have those nice precision movements like some of our other fish. So it's a trade-off. They, they don't have great balance, uh, but they kind of gain the ability to hide in these really tight spaces. So I think that's a really good point. And they move their body back and forth in order to kind of get where they're going, using their whole body as like a paddle versus swimming like this or like this, like other fish. <laughs> yes, like, like you, giant sea bass. <laughs> this is our, our giant sea bass, which I think is, is pretty fun. Uh, Vashti wants to know, what do puffer fish eat? Oh, that's a great question. Maybe we'll put our puffer fish image back up. So we were talking about mouths, right? Oh, there's the eel again. Awesome. It's okay. I keep changing it up. So uh, Miss Stacy's going to put up our puffer fish again. They have, again, those really hard teeth. Now, again, there are some puffers that have two. They have one on the top and one on the bottom, and some that have two on the top and two on the bottom and they are crushing up things that have shells. There you go, so they have, um, and their mouth, even though they're kind of this ball, right? Uh, their mouth sticks out, I have kind of like these little fishy lips. You see that? And that allows them to kind of pick inside little spaces and pull out things that might have shells like little crabs, um, little shrimp. They would love to be able to grab some of that and eat it. Okay, some other questions. Irvine asked, what eats the little eels? Uh, 
So, oh, okay. So um, the garden eels that we were looking at, so Miss Amanda found some fun facts for us. So Pacific snake eels will burrow under their colony and eat them from below. That's crazy. So the answer is other eels. The Pacific snake eel apparently will come underneath because remember, if they get scared, they actually dive all the way in. There's one right there. That's <laughs> just a little face, like a little sneaker eel. So the little sneaker eel is showing us, oh, do you see it go down? They will pop below the sand and hide. So for most fish, this is a really hard meal to catch. But a bigger eel that could be a predator dives underneath the sand and pulls them from below. That's crazy. I had never heard that before. I'm learning with you. All right. Uh, and, and also, uh, she had mentioned the triggerfish is another predator of the garden eel. So um, other bigger fish, basically. Triggerfish are also pretty tenacious. They, um, they have really good balance. <laughs> they, uh, they have fins on the top and bottom and will often kind of tip their body towards the, the sand to grab their food. And they use those fins for balance, which is pretty awesome. All right, let's go ahead and I, I see there's a couple more questions coming in. Let's go ahead and visit Captain Joe and make sure uh, we can touch base with him before we wrap up our program today. Well, hello, uh, boys Lower and Key girls. Forest. I Very have cool. found my way to Laura Key Forest, and you'll never believe it, but I just made over 100 brand new best friends, and they're all called lorikeets. Now, lorikeets are special parrots found in Australia and New Guinea. They can be found in fruit trees in the rainforest because they love to eat pollen, nectar, and fruit. In fact, they have a very special adaptation found in their mouth to help them lick up fruit juice and pollen, and it's a hairy tongue. Interestingly, lorikeets do very well eating fruit, but unlike some other parrots, they can't eat seeds. Wasn't that interesting? So we've been talking all about adaptations. We all have adaptations. You have adaptations, we have adaptations, and the animals that we've been discovering today all have ways to help us survive. So, you know, thinking about that, maybe after our program today, you can kind of think about your favorite animal and what special things does your favorite animal have that helps it live in its habitat. So this is the lorikeet. Now the lorikeet likes to live in places like Australia and we said New Guinea, and they have these beautiful colors. So again, color can help it. It stands out right now, but if you were to imagine that lorikeet living in a big fruit tree with lots of green and maybe reds and yellows, or a, a, a tree that has lots of flowers so they can eat that pollen, it would blend in. And again, they have a, <laughs> a hairy tongue that allows them to scrape off that pollen or even lap up that nectar or even soak up some of that juice from fruits. Pretty cool. So again, thinking about your favorite animal and what special things does your favorite animal have to help it? Some last questions here. Are the garden eels different colors? So the garden eels may have different spot patterns on them and I'm and there are different kinds of garden eels out there that have different patterns on them. So not all of them have the same kind of patterns that we were seeing. And I think that would be something fun if you're curious to investigate are the different kinds of garden eels out there because they do come in lots of really fun colors and patterns. And then uh, what is the largest eel in the world? Thank you for that question, Francis. The European conger eel, are you ready for this? Can be 19 feet long. That's huge. <laughs> that is really big. And uh, I am slightly unsettled by it being 19 feet long. I don't know why. It'd be so cool to see, but I think I'd have to mentally be ready to see it. I think if it just swam past and then just kept swimming past and then more <laughs> and then more, like the train you don't expect to keep going, uh, that would be awesome. But it would probably make me a little um, startled. <laughs> And I think here's our very last question here. Martinez um, family asked, do pufferfish lay eggs like all other fish? Yes, they do. Now, there, that's another whole 
avenue of talking about adaptations, you know, how animals have their baby and how babies and how they raise their babies can be so different. Like our, our bird here, right? What do birds lay? They lay eggs too, but they do it very differently than fish. Our puffer fish friends usually release their eggs out into the water, but some fish like to release their eggs into a nest like the, the Garibaldi. So it really just depends on the fish. These are great questions, by the way. Questions that scientists ask. So thank you for, for uh, making observations today, thinking like scientists, asking questions like scientists, and just being generally curious. I learned some new things today. I'm going to be thinking about that eel swimming past <laughs> 19 feet long and also about the eels that hunt from below. I had never heard that before, which is crazy. Thank you so much, Explorer, for joining us today. And we still have programming throughout the rest of the day and tomorrow and next week. So join us for our online academy. Take care.